There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the One Within All to another Interverse Exploration. I'm your host, Chance, and this recording is coming at you from March 20th, 2020. That beautiful space in the seasons where the winter of the old year ebbs gently into the emergence of the rejuvenating spring. It's definitely my favorite place on the calendar, not only because my natal sun returns to its origin point right between Aries and Pisces, but also because it's a moment of stark transition and transformation that shows us over and again the tendency of things to become their opposite. The pervasive enigma behind and between every speck of matter and every fleeting instant, this is the mystery that we revere when we, as nature itself, celebrate life in its birth, growth, blooming, and withering. It's this underlying energy hiding in the middle of everything that moves us on both the perceptual and physical planes. And although it has many names in the pages of human philosophy, like God, nature, and the Tao, our guest for today likes to describe it by what it does and how it feels. He calls this foundational force of the universe the drift. Coming at an improbably perfect time following up our deep dive conversation a few weeks ago about Qigong, Today's visitor in our auditory portal is an author, poet, professor, and teacher of mind-body connecting arts, writing, and natural philosophy. His name is Anthony Gilbert, and he's a New York native who grew up within an interesting intersection of martial arts and transcendental naturalism. Among the many written works Anthony has published, today we'll be taking a look at his newest offering, Notes from the Drift, a collection of memoirs rooted in poetic beauty, and throughout its pages, Professor Gilbert weaves a wonderfully wandering way through memories accumulated over years of traveling the American continent while finding synchronization with the source of all creation, that unfathomably orderly yet incalculably chaotic intelligence in nature that he calls the drift. In a passage from the book, Professor Gilbert says that the virtue of the drift lies in that each belongs to themselves. Isn't it time you were self-possessed? Isn't it time you abandoned the hypertension of writ and holy ledger and follow the grain, the current, become the way? If you need a mystical riddle to get yourself going, consider these words. Stepping out from where the sun falls on the leaf, you could become the sage that moves the world. I really enjoyed the mystical musings and cosmo-psychological philosophies that flow from the pages of Professor Gilbert's book, and if you get inspired by this conversation and want to get a copy for yourself, check the show notes for the links to his website, anthonygilberts.net, and the Amazon page where you can pick up notes from The Drift. It's definitely looking like days, weeks, or months are coming where we'll have little choice but to veg out and kill time or to take advantage of the slowed down pace of life during the social distancing that's going on and seek more nourishing ways to spend these solitary moments. Although Notes from the Drift makes for a quick read that you could complete in a single day, the perspectives it contains might just echo within you for a lifetime. You can also check the show notes for a link to sign up for Interverse Plus where you can support one of your favorite podcasts. Get the extended version of this episode, early access to new stuff I publish, and best of all, if you do it now, it'll feel like you're wishing me a happy birthday while you get a present that we'll both be glad you have. Access to the entire gigantic archive of extended podcasts that I would very much like for you to hear. But now let's kick off this talk with the sagacious professor of human potential and devoted documenter of The Drift, the magically insightful and totally well-traveled Anthony Gilbert. Many thanks for being here, Professor, and welcome to the Interverse. Thank you very much. That was an amazing introduction. Oof. I have to say that. Wow. I'm not really sure I live up to that, but thank you. <laughs> well, it's like the main spot that I get to be creative is the intro. So I was especially warmed up for it after uh, reading through the part of the book that I hadn't finished yet earlier today. And yeah, good writing. I always find that reading stuff that's well-written makes me write better and makes me speak better. So I appreciate you for contributing. Well, thank you. Thank you. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, maybe let's just kick off with what inspired you to write this book, Notes from the Drift, and what would you say it's about, if that's possible? Inspiration is simple. About six months before I turned 50, I started wondering, after a lifetime of traveling, meeting different teachers along the way, 
one starts to look at the the mileage one has on oneself. I think at the 50 is that kind of landmark age where you consider these things. And I really was looking for what had I learned? And more importantly, among the things that I learned, was there anything that I really wanted to focus on that I would leave my kids? I started, I started musing on that and I wrote up an initial just 10 sections to get a feel for it. And there's a few different philosophies running through it in terms of how I wrote it but really just wanted to get across what I had learned. And I wanted to put it into a type of writing that did not preach at you, but more tried to inspire you to go look yourself. So that's what kicked it off. It became something unexpected as it grew. Um, and it took about two years to put it together. What is it about? The notion of the drift is very much similar to the notion of the Tao. I was trying to get away from any foreign language in this because the foreign tends to be exoticized. And one of the realities that we never really talk about in terms of Taoist studies is that if the Tao is truly a universal thing, then it has to exist in every culture and it has to have an expression in every way. It's not something that just the Chinese own. It's something that the humanity owns. So I started wanting to see what that was like in the American context, and what did my ideas and thoughts look like when I stripped out everything foreign and just settled into American English and seeing if I could still capture the same ideas, but in a way that average people could access them that they didn't have, they didn't need a, a different lexicon for. Yeah, I definitely would agree that it's an accessible language <laughs> that you use throughout it. It's poetic, it's beautiful, it's descriptive. There's parts where I'm seeing the image of a beaver splashing its tail in the water and it's like painting a picture. It's accessing and tapping into the imagination without being overly like describing every little detail. It's succinct. It's great. You can, it's these bite sized chunks. If you bought the book, you could read a page of it a day and ponder on just that page, which is pretty cool. One line that I really liked is that finding the drift restores our resonance with the greater universe. And I, th I would say I got the impression from the stories and the little snippets of your personal experience that are in there that you're kind of like a Jack Kerouac, Dharma bum type of wanderer in your early years looking for these truths, but a lot healthier version without maybe like the alcoholism and depression. <laughs> yes. Strangely enough, there's an earlier book that where it turns around and it talks about burning my Kerouac to heat up some pork and beans, but that's a different story. I grew up in the tradition of the Beats. Many of my early teachers were of that generation. And being a, an ex jenner kind of simmered in the after effect of the hippie movement and the beat movement. What I tried to get away from in my life was the idea that, you know, Kerouac and Ginsburg, and, and I knew Ginsburg before he died. They touched on ideas of Buddhism. They practiced ideas of Buddhism, but they didn't really study these things at a depth that would have clarified, I think, a lot of the misconceptions and mistakes that they made in their process. I didn't want to get caught up in, in being beat or being hip or any of that. I just wanted to move past it. And I think that those are the things that uh, spending a decade practicing one tradition will get you very deeply. So... As much as I, yes, I'm definitely the idea of the wanderer, more in that sense of Xuanzu's free and easy wandering, just wandering for the sake of experience, not for the sake of going any place. Although a lot of the stories and, and bits and pieces in here are way stations. They're liminal points between going from point A to point B. So maybe I am traveling for work and I take a side trip, just wander. You know, get an extra day someplace, go wander. Coming across the country, if I felt an urge to get off the highway, I would. And that's kind of a, an expression of, of years of practice where you just kind of feel you're being pulled in a different direction and you kind of just explore it for a bit. And that's what ends up making all of the pieces that create the collection. Yeah, those are some of the best moments when you just listen to that inner voice and go, yeah, I don't know why, but I want to go this way. <laughs> Sometimes that's where the biggest synchronicities end up occurring. The ones that you had no idea were even coming. Yeah, but in our emails back and forth, I put forward the classic statement attributed to Lao Tzu 
that says something to the effect of that which we call the Tao is not the true Tao. And then in this context, we're referring to this concept of the drift, this universal force. And to that, you had a pretty intriguing response, which I'd kind of like to open up into this conversation about the philosophy of Taoism and to see if we can break that traditional law by giving a, as true a description of what it is as we can. Sure. Uh, the email was my response was a little tongue in cheek. The idea that, you know, if you giving due to, to Lao Tzu, the statement that you cannot talk about the Tao is true in the sense that to separate anything from the whole and say this is Tao is then to lose the Tao altogether because the Tao is the whole. So that notion of you can't talk about it. Well, yes, you can't talk about it because how do you talk about everything that is inclusive of yourself? At the same time, you can talk about it because if you use language that doesn't say this is the Tao or that's the Tao, but then talk about, let's say, the aesthetics or the quality or the flow, you're still just describing qualities of the Tao, but you just can't, you can't make it a noun. You have to make it an experience or, an, or a verb. So if you look at Tao as verb, you're probably in a safer place, and Lao Tzu would probably not point his finger from on high at you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot like what you might call the flow state, where the thinking mind isn't really in between the direct experience and the experiencer. Yes. Well, for Taoists, especially ancient Taoists, the notion was that everything was moving. So everything literally is verb. You know, everything is an action. Even as I'm sitting here talking now, what I define as Anthony is an action. It's a, it's a, it's a thing happening. So if you talk about it like that, yeah, you're, you're safe. And I think at some point, too, that's also ties in, that notion also ties into the Chinese cultural perspective of limiting control. Who is the master? Who's not the master? And one thing that I like to say about human nature is that it's not anything specific or fixed. We can't point to one quality of humanity and say that's human nature. Humans are evil or humans are great. It's more like humans are what human nature is what we are becoming in that moment. And I think that's another way that we as individuals are representative of the totality itself. Yes. But we have to keep in mind uh, the total we are a small part of the totality. One of the things that I kind of rail against is the notion of the Tao being anthropomorphized. The Tao is not a human thing. The Tao is a universal thing of which humans are a part of, but we, we are no—we are by no means the dominant force there. Right, it's not something that you learn to wield and control or something. No, no, it's it's very much the Tao is a very inhuman thing. It is not codified in any way by any structure that humanity can understand as of this point in our evolution. I'm not sure what happens later on, but right now. Those people who come to come at you and say the Tao is like this or the Tao is like that, and it has something and it has a, a very human quality to it, that's not truly Tao. Tao is like nature. It is loving and it is destructive and it is at the same time that it is the babbling brook that is very romantic, it is also the volcano and the tidal wave and the tsunami. And everything that comes along with it, even what we're experiencing now is, is Tao. This is some response. This pandemic is some response to something that we're unconscious of. And it moved and flowed through the world in a way that many of us have never seen before. But it's all Tao. Right. And every expression of it, whether we find it terrifying or awe-inspiring, is containing the lessons that we need to be aware of our inner self composition in this moment and in the time leading up to where we are now and maybe even to see where the flow is going next and kind of apt for the metaphorical storm that the world seems to be in right now. In one section, you say on the dark edge of the storm, we bathe in primitive wonder, no lessons given, no devotions made, no sutras recited, nothing is holy and yet everything is sacred. We've sharpened our senses, rid ourselves of repressive teachers, and these moments we tend to our lives with only our breath. I think that is a 
it's one of several moments throughout the book where you point out that the authority in humanity isn't truth and that truth is more of the authority and truth is this verb more than it is this thing you can pin down. To me, it, it makes sense that wisdom traditions from long ago had a living oral tradition and that things were more easily corrupted when they get put down into a text that is then you know, given a certain interpretation by the holy man or the priest. So I, and this, that, that's something that I really appreciate about your book is that, that it, that's pointed out repeatedly. Well, all tradition is just somebody's perspective. Yeah, it's kind of strange to talk about Taoism in this context. Right now in the United States, I would count as many as four different types of Taoism that are being discussed. You know, you have the Taoism in which we understand in the modern context, and you have a certain amount of Americans who become Taoist priests and a certain amount of Taoist priests that have come here to America. And that represents a way of thinking, many times described as the only way of, of approaching the Tao, but it's really not. If you go back to, say, mid-50s, we had two different types of Taoism. We had an intellectual Taoism or philosophical Taoism, and we had a spiritual Taoism. Spiritual Taoism clearly became the religious Taoism, but the intellectual Taoism, now, you know, you transplant that into the United States, you have intellectual Taoism being discussed within universities. And if you're, it's kind of the, the hammer metaphor. If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if you're in a philosophy department, Taoism is a philosophy. If you're in a religious studies department, Taoism is a religion. And so you have those three, and then you have the new layer that's been put on in the last, say, 30 years of people who are practicing Taoist arts like Qigong or Tai Chi. Although Tai Chi is more Buddhist than Taoist, no one really wants to admit that, but it is. And now you have people who are lay practitioners at home practicing a Taoist movement art for health reasons, which is not really the reason it was created, and reading translations of Taoism by pop translators that creates a whole different level of Taoism. And so you end up in our culture having these four different, very distinct, I don't say philosophical, cultural perspectives that each one, each one within the group says that the rest are not authentic. So it's, like I said, it's very interesting talking about Taoism like this when, you know, you have all of those different perspectives out there and everybody pointing the finger at who is the most Tao. <laughs> right. Which seems to definitely be a pointless exercise to uh, <laughs> try to say you've got the real thing. It's more about, your individual relationship with what your practice is or what your philosophical perspective is. And I think it's interesting. You say that like Qigong, for example, people practice it for health reasons, but that wasn't its original intent. I actually, I did Qigong right before we got on this call. It's something I try to do as frequently as possible and find, I, I can't say that it's making me healthier or not, but I do know that on a energy level, the energy boost I get from it makes me more aware of my internal state and things around me after I've done that practice. So what, what is the original intent of the practice? It's touched on it, the sense that you are more aware. So remember, everything, Taoism in, in, its, in its initial and in, in earliest formation was an empiric observation of reality. We, you know, Taoists observed the universe and tried to learn from it, tried to tried to be good students and see what it was, what it was going to teach. And all of the ideas of authenticity and originalness and acting without acting, all of that comes from an empirical observation of reality. The point of Qigong, when you get into it, the idea of what does Qigong ultimately do is it fine tunes the body. And fine tunes your consciousness so that you are habitually more aware. So, like you just practiced and you said, okay, I, I feel like I'm more aware of things around me. You're more, you're more aware of your own energy, which can seem like you've got more of it now because you're aware of it, but ultimately you have the energy you have, you have the chi that you have. And you're becoming, as you deepen your conscious awareness of it. It becomes more of who you are and thus more usable. You can be more aware of when you're block when you have blockages and have to free and loosen them up. It, sometimes the words don't really fit. So 
right? It's, there's an experience in there when you're practicing it, and that is what it is. And the, the words are just a an attempt to paint a picture. Yeah. So a lot of the forms that I do in the Qigong practice that I've picked up are based on animal movements, which is also an interesting part of it. Is that you're you're saying Taoism and Taoist practices are based on empirical observation of nature. There's a perfect example of it. Yes, exactly. The idea would be if nature is more authentic than man, then moving the way nature does puts us in a more authentic position. And mastery at that point becomes how habitualized you become to that experience. So what do you mean by how habitualized you become to it? Okay, so when doing Qigong, how well... So you go through these processes when you're learning a form. You memorize the form, which is the first step. You memorize breathing patterns within the form, how you exhale, how you inhale. You memorize or you start to become aware of how the energy moves in you. Is it moving through the external meridians? Is it moving through the eight extraordinary meridians on the inside? How is it moving? You know, what's, it, what's this all supposed to be? Doing? What's the overall experience of this? And then you have the small, as you come closer and closer to those, those moments, the aha moments of this is what this is about. And you have that expression of whether you call it the flow or just a sense of altered awareness of a deeper experience of self. That's the stages that you're going through as this is happening. But then you start to get into that, be able to get into that quicker when you do the practice. So, you know, first couple of years, you're just learning how to move and you're learning to memorize the form and you're learning to breathe and you're learning to get all of that clear. And you'll have some experiences from that, but keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it to the point where it becomes second nature. And now you're not thinking about it. You're just experiencing it. And then after you move from that experience of self, the next stage is going to be interacting with the world around you. Can you feel? How far out can you feel your chi? Can you feel when other things come into connection with your chi? And as you do that more and more, it starts to happen or that becomes your natural experience of self. It's not something that's related to the form. The form is a scaffolding that teaches you how to extend your perception. But then at some point, you don't need the scaffold anymore. The whole notion of spontaneous Qigong. You feel you have a blockage and you move in a certain way that frees the blockage. You have that consciousness of your own energy, but then you're also aware of energy fields that come into relationship with you. And then that starts to lead or bleed over into those moments that you have where you're passing by somebody and you kind of know what their intent is, you know, and the higher level. And those areas are where the martial arts have really kind of grabbed onto this, the idea that you could heighten perception to a point where you would be aware of your opponent's intent. But ultimately, that was not what it was designed for. What it was designed for was to make you aware of the Tao. That's pretty amazing, though, the concept that it's giving you an extension on your range of perception. And I mean, it's one of those things that you can't necessarily do. If you have multiple practices, you can't necessarily point to one and say, this is one causing that. But I know in the last many years that I've been doing mindfulness practices, meditation and things like Qigong, I have, I mean, I've, I'm pretty sure I've had a lot more psychic type experiences with other people since then. Or like you said, the chi is always there, but you're more aware of it. Perhaps I'm just noticing when the psychic moments are happening because when we're all caught up in our heads in the past or the future or in anxiety or fear of some kind, we're not really paying attention to the way we sync up with the world or with other people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So did you pick up this practice with your background of uh, martial arts? Is that where you wound up stumbling into it? Well, I mean, there are certain there are certain levels of Buddhism, of course, which is where I started everything, that that lean into this more esoteric board. Buddhism leads into this. My Judo background, not particularly. My Aikido background definitely was leading in this direction. What did it for me actually was that I got into a car accident and banged myself up pretty bad. 
And my acupuncturist said, you should do Tai Chi. And then found access into, found a Tai Chi community to work with and started becoming very interested in Tai Chi and Qigong as a, because I saw it as having certain qualities in it, similar to the Aikido, but I didn't have to get thrown on my back, which was at that point damaged. So this became a, a nice alternative. It's movement, but without, you know, without it having any uh, serious physical component to it where I'm, uh, I'm battling somebody else, just playing in, in Aikido or playing in Tai Chi, same thing. But the notion that these things could lead to that experience. So I would say all the experiences kind of blended together and they reached a point where I just didn't want to hurt anybody anymore. You do as a martial artist, I hope most martial artists come to this, that there's a point where how many ways do you need to know to hurt a human being? And isn't it better than to start learning how to help human beings without actually accessing any of that, those things, you know, those, those expressions. I was at a Jigung, one of my first Jigung weekend workshops, and I was next to a, a Jesuit priest who I was just, at one point I had to ask, like, excuse me, Father, why are you here? <laughs> and he said to me, he says, well, if Jesus could heal people, shouldn't I learn to? And I just took on a different, a different take. You know, I, I mean, just all of a sudden, everything that all my interests in, in martial arts fell aside. And I just wanted to learn more about this, this presence, this awareness. And I started from there. That's really interesting. And that's an, a good point. I mean, why shouldn't we all become the healers in our world? It's my question would be, is the healing that you're able to transfer through this knowledge more based on getting people into their own personal practice or does this ever branch into types of energy healing work or is there a connection there? So I, I'm very much about getting people to access their own healing, you know, basically access an awareness of themselves that allows for them to heal themselves. But I, I am skilled and, and capable of, he, of using Qigong as a healing modality. I just, I'm not called to it the way certain people are. I think healing very much in that shamanic tradition is a calling. You have to be called to it. I just wasn't, you know, so I, can I, yes, do I occasionally, it's not the most comfortable thing for me. Yeah. There's a lot of <laughs> complicated energetic situations to consider. Like I think if you are someone that's interested in energy healing, it's not, because I, I mean, I've heard this from other Qigong teachers that you, you don't really want to ever be trying to, push your chi out of your body or transfer it or transmit it. And so that subtle nuance can be a big deal, especially for someone that might be called to the uh, idea of healing, healing, <laughs> but still have the notion of like, I'm doing this. It's, it, I'm the special one. I'm the healer that can lead them to, to sort of inadvertently open up a channel to a two way transfer of energy where I think the, most authentic way for healing to take place is when you as the healer are more guiding the other person's consciousness and their body awareness into the places where their attention needs to be for their body to do the healing itself. Because ultimately that's the only thing that can heal is the body healing itself. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right with that. A good way to look at it. If done properly, when you, do what is called applying chi to others. It is not that you're pushing your chi out of your body. Your chi is already radiating. So, you know, around you. So what you want to do is you want to set a certain intention to that, purify your own chi and clear your own chi to the point where it becomes, it's almost, it's like in physics where you have one wavelength and you couple another wavelength to it and then the two take on the two waves will take on the characteristics of the more dominant wave so if your health is well and you're working with somebody whose health is weaker you want their chi to kind of resonate with your chi so that it picks up how to be healthy again 
what you don't want to do, and, and, and this is where it becomes dangerous because you can get flow back if you're not skilled at this, where you can take some of those bad qualities into your own awareness. This idea that the dominant wave is going to cause the weaker wave to adapt to its pattern rather than the other way around. I feel like that's a huge concept that applies to everything in this wave-based energetic reality, including stuff like all the fear that comes through the media, especially lately, and things that are attempts at manipulation or even straight up mind control, that having this stronger wave, which is built around your intention and your knowledge that your intention and your um, actions to purify your chi do cause you to be this sort of strong and and whole and uh, not armored, but but I guess more dominant type of mind in the the mind sphere, and that that gives you psychic immunity to a degree to this higher level of of self awareness. I'd say yes on the second part. Dominant is not a word I particularly like. There's too much baggage attached to the idea. It's more like one horse setting the pace for another horse. If you've ever ridden and you, you'll see, or if you're watching a flock of seagulls, not seagulls, geese, the lead goose is breaking the atmosphere in a certain way that the eddies then make it easier for those following the V pattern behind them. So you want to set pace for the other person. You want to, yeah, you don't want to become dominant where you're forcing their chi into a pattern. I don't think you can actually, you know, there has to be, it's more symbiotic. It's more of an agreement. It's more, it's done from a much more loving place than, or a place of honesty of wanting to help. Not so much of that, that sense of dominance. No, that word should not even be in healing anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Not, maybe not the best choice of word, but strong, stronger or more, uh, you know, I, I agree with that. That sounds like a, a good way to describe it, that it's more like a guidance system. It's a template of wholeness that the other body can resonate to. Template of wholeness. That's it. You've got that. That's it. Yep. Very cool. <laughs> so we did kind of say earlier that these type of movement practices, which I'm really glad that we're talking a lot about, aren't necessarily increasing your chi because, at least in the philosophy of Taoism and Chinese medicine, a person kind of has the chi that they have, or there's different kinds of chi uh, where there's a, a personal chi that is for your life and it it is a set amount and it's almost like your fate or your dharma. But do you think that there is any bioenergetic strengthening that happens through these practices? Is Is it actually building up something that you might not have if you get really uh, good at this. And my reason for asking this is because I've personally seemed to experience that the more I did, did this type of thing and built up my bioenergy or my awareness of my bioenergy, that my capacity for creativity increased quite a bit. But it could be, I guess, now that I'm looking at it a little differently, that it's my awareness that's increasing and therefore I can tap in or view the perceptual mechanism that is imagination more clearly? Does that sound right? I would say it's accurate. From my perspective, we go back to the simple saying that's that's taught in almost every Qigong school. The body follows the chi, the chi follows the mind, which means that it's mind first, then chi, then movement or healing. You know, so if you start with the intent, the intent tonifies or the intent gives meaning to the energy, and then the energy changes the external structure. Think about it radiating, radiating out from center, from, from, from your heart. The Chinese call it Zin, the heart mind, the center of your being, which is, which is the part of you that, strangely enough, is both connected to the Tao at the most deepest level. Your heart is the first organ that starts, that forms, and everything else forms around it. So, from that point where we are deeply connected and rooted to the Tao, everything radiates out from. So it's always going to be that, you know, that sense of, and not mind in the sense of the mind that gets addicted to things or the mind that wants, you know, an ice cream cone or the newest 
version of destiny, <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the, the, the true mind, the, the, the universal self and everything radiates out from there. So the more you become aware, the more your awareness deepens and externalizes, the more your awareness goes to the core of who you are. And at the same time is stretching out into the universe, the more you become aware of yourself in that experience. And thus the chi follows. So to the extent that your chi becomes tonified or stronger as an expression or as something radiating out from consciousness, it's going to. It's going to because your consciousness is becoming deeper and stronger. Uh, So a lot of Qigong practices do talk about connecting heaven and earth energy and sometimes involve feeling a type of flow connecting the above and the below. But another way that I like to look at that has a lot, is a lot like what you're describing of this beingness radiating from the core to the surface is that part of connecting heaven and earth energy is actually involving the within and the without energy. Like the core in is up in this metaphor in a, in a sense. And I find a lot of value in that, that we feel from the inside first and the outside. It's like it has something to do with reversing the state that a lot of people begin life in, which is that the world is acting on them and realizing that the world is coming from our inside out, if that makes sense. Bill, let me, let me, let me tweak your melon a bit on this one. So the metaphors of heaven and earth are you know, connected deeply to the concepts of yin and yang. Earth, yin, heaven, yang. Let's try to get it out of those old concepts and put it into new concepts. So imagine yourself as a 100 BC Taoist practitioner. It's very easy to understand heaven. Heaven is above, earth is below. Okay, so we have a directional thing going on there. But what are the qualities of heaven and earth? We got to... A lot of what we have to do today, and I am by far not a classical Taoist, but a lot of what we have to do today as practitioners is to recognize what these old metaphors deeply meant. Not just what we're told they meant, but go deeper than what you're told. You look up at heaven, heaven is amorphous, heaven is flowing, heaven is moving, it's erratic, it becomes new things. Clouds form, they disappear, storms come, they, you know, they pass. Heaven is always moving. Whereas earth is solid, earth is not moving, earth tends to be you know, something you can rely upon. So a more apt set of metaphors for the modern context might be instead of yin and yang or heaven and earth, the idea of conformity representing the, the natural elements of the yin expression and novelty representing the natural elements of heaven. Novelty is always flowing, always moving, always amorphous. It's it's things in the state of becoming. Earth is conforming. It is it is a thing. It is it is a very physical object. Thus it is and anything about a stone, everything within the stone is conforming. The elements and the en- and the energies are not as loose as say water. So we have those two metaphors. So let's think about novelty. It's in a spectrum between novelty and conforming and, ca- and conformity. You have novelty on one side, novelty, too much of it, nothing is solidified, nothing is real, everything is in this state of of almost becoming. And then too much conformity Nothing grows, nothing changes. Everything is just locked in place. There's no movement whatsoever. Thus, in the middle, where the Chinese imagined man to be, between heaven and earth, is where novelty informs and creates new things, and conformity stabilizes them so that they can exist. And then when things get too conforming, novelty breaks that up. So they need each other. They're not opposites. They're interlaced, different states of being playing off of each other, creating evolution, creating movement, 
creating everything that we see in front of us. And if you sit and you really contemplate that, you'll start to see that everything is constantly in this flux of novelty and conforming. That is a real brain blower. (laughs) I, I love that actually. And it just made me think quite a bit about the current worldwide pandemic situation and how we've had a lot of conformity for a long time in mass with humanity. I mean, not every person is purely in conformity, but by and large, because of very centralized ways of culture reproducing and also of authority systems, people are really more in that sort of uh, stuck passivity. I mean, the the earth has a positive and a negative and the the heaven energy has a positive and the negative and one of the, too much of anything is kind of where you get into the the imbalance or the problem with it so too much passive conformity might be getting balanced out a little bit by the shakeup that is caused by this virus thing and it made me think a lot about this quote from your book where you say in the cities and suburbs, it has become just as young feared. We are slaves to our fictions. We live stories that promote the silent continuity of our lies. Our every limitation, another disease of imagination. I loved that part. That was one of my favorite lines. I think that kind of demonstrates the point that I was trying to make, that we are sort of self-limiting by the stories we tell ourselves of what we can and can't do and who we are. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So apart from a disease that comes in, freaks everybody the hell out, (laughs) what are some steps in our personal lives for getting back into the middle between conformity and reality? Because a lot of us might see the symptoms of this problem, even in ourselves, and still feel like we don't have the means or we're not capable of breaking out of a, a nine to five that we don't like and getting the ability to go explore the world and, and enter that flow. I would say, you know, it is, it is a practice to learn the idea of yin and yang, the idea of novelty and conformity. It's something you have to attune yourself to. With that in mind, um, I'm, I'm not really sure how to tell people how to do that. I have a hard enough time telling my own students how to do it. <laughs> yeah, f- fair enough. <laughs> So I think I think one of the things people should realize right now is that you know yeah it, I, I have to say looking at the world right now where we are we are we ha- we are experiencing a massive novelty event you know almost like the ones that that kind of Terence McKenna talked about you know and the, turning into the 21st century would be this time of heightened novelty. One of the things McKenna didn't consider really was that novelty is a very inhuman thing. So it's going to be not always in our favor. <laughs> and we're, we're at that. We're experiencing that. An expression of novelty, the first truly global pandemic of the modern age. And it's forcing, the flip side of that is that it's forcing a response is absolute conformity. Don't go anywhere. Stay six feet away from everybody. Give up most of what makes you human. And all I can say to people is look for the opportunities because right now we are in a, such a state of heightened novelty. I think you could probably pull off almost anything. Now, pulling off almost anything could on one end look like a massive creative expression or, you know, global fascism. <laughs> it's really true. I mean, it's like we're on this knife's edge. And even in astrology, there's symbolic evidence of the situation we're in with Saturn leaving its home zone of Capricorn and moving into Aquarius, which is sort of, I've heard this as a metaphor that it's basically like the teacher is leaving the classroom and we can do whatever we want, but the teacher's coming back because Saturn will retrograde back into Capricorn. So while Saturn is in this like Aquarius energy, things are weird. We might be like trapped in, we're still in the classroom, but the teacher's away. And it's like our chance to come up with something so amazing that we don't need that teacher anymore. And we can graduate that classroom or we get to flunk and do it all over again. But maybe the teacher will be more pissed off at us this time around. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could see that being 
absolutely true as well. Yeah, so I think it's like August that Capricorn or Saturn goes back into Capricorn. So watch out, everybody. <laughs> but we're talking about this look, looking at the inside and the outside thing. And one of the most useful teaching tools I've discovered for doing doing this for myself, helping me uh, be aware of what my heart's decision is instead of being torn between uh, like a heart and mind, uh, fear and love type of schism in in my decision making is I Ching. I found that every time I use the I Ching, it just tells me exactly what I already know, but in a way where, okay, now I can't pretend that I don't really know that. And I was wondering if your studies in Taoism led you to look at I Ching at all, because you did mention Terrence McKenna and his whole time wave zero thing was based largely on I Ching, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. A lot of time looking at McKenna's work early on, I think, you know, people talk about him as a psychedelic bard and, and really what he is, is a bard for new thought. The thought that comes from allowing novelty to break up things in new ways. So I did not find his work to be all that interesting. It seemed a little arbitrary here and there in terms of, you know, he's setting his date on when they think the I Ching was written, but that date is now moved back and they find that there are different, you know, every year we get more and more scholarship changes, should be changing the algorithm that he based all those ideas off of. I, you know, you'd need to know the exact moment it was put together in order to say that that was the beginning of the time wave. So I, I find his work interesting, metaphorically, but dubious as something I want to plan my life around. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> The I Ching in general is interesting. I don't do a lot of work with the I Ching. It's, it's not a modality that I, again, you know, the idea of divination, I look at Taoism more as surfing. I am feeling the waves as they come and trying to adapt to my environment in a way that benefits me. So I find with the notion of predictive elements. First off, I don't think you can predict the wave because the wave is always changing. You know, you'd have to have a perspective further out than our perspective. Humans are in, let's call it the drift, and we are in the drift. We are moving with it. We are part of it. To really predict where it was going would be to be in this dimension beyond where we are looking down. And I've heard a lot of People over the years talk about being able to do that. And I don't, I've lived long enough that some of the people who impressed me when I was in my 20s failed. They, I watched them come apart. I watched them base their lives on this idea of being able to predict things and know what's coming and following a set set of patterns. And they came apart. And so my attitude is, I don't think that there is a ability to predict what's going to happen. I think you can pretty much tell the big rocks are coming and you adjust. Like, like if you've ever surfed or kayaked, you adjust to the environment. You change your own flow and pattern to adjust to the bigger pattern. And, you know, and that's, and that's, again, that's that level of self-awareness that I was talking about earlier, where you, you learn to be aware of the world around you and adjust to it. You live within a, an environment and you can move with the environment or you can try to move against it or predict where it's going to be and jump ahead. But my experience has been that all those people who say that they can come apart. Right. I think that I've seen that. And I'm, you know, I'm only in my early thirties, but there's been people that I looked up to who ended up kind of having the same thing go on. I just overall never set a date for your prophecy, <laughs> but I agree in the idea that like getting outside of the whole to somehow see the entirety of this universal organism that we're part of from an outside perspective, it kind of defeats the uh, idea that it's the all. How could you get outside of the all? So Exactly. But that being said, since the all is one interconnected expression of life and we are only 
in the experience of separation due to a sort of vortexing in that primal water that causes a type of wall structure to appear that we're down in the bottom of like this tornado that our ego metaphorically is within the currents of the overall reality. That being said, the same wave or the same current is going through the entire stream at this, at one moment. And at the very least my, so like with, with me and Qigong, it's not, not Qigong with me and I Ching, it's not something I've ever tried to make actual predictions about anything with, but I I find it a really cool thing to show people that the energy of the moment is going to reflect in every facet of the moment. And so as a reflective tool, more than a predictive tool, it's, in my experience, really amazing. Mm -hmm. I remember playing around with it when I was doing my Jigong teacher training, and a lot of people were very fascinated by it. And I think there are many touchstones that, you know, like you were saying, right now you have an idea and the I Ching will back up what you think is, is going on. So it's reinforcing that your intuition is correct. At some point, you really won't need it. It's another form of scaffolding. At some point, you'll just learn to trust your intuition. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, playing around with my deck style I Ching that I've got. It sort of works like an Oracle deck. And I was just kind of mindlessly shuffling it around as we were talking about I Ching. And a few moments ago, I thought about 44, which is uh, attraction of opposites. And then uh, just a second ago, I just randomly cut the deck and looked at the card and it was that card. And I'd just been continually shuffling it. So it does weird stuff like that all the time, but it's subjective to you. And if you need some reinforcing of the fact that like that everything is subjective to you and that you're the center of your personal reality vortex and it imitates out from your core to the external, then yeah, it's pretty cool. And I definitely wouldn't tell people not to experiment with it. Oh no. But I, I uh, agree with you that once you get the sense of how that feels, it's like, it's sort of like getting the sense of how moving energy blockages in your body feels whenever you're doing a movement practice and eventually the more advanced Qigong is a very internal and possibly not even requiring movement type of experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say so. I'd say so. There's uh, well, the great thing about Qigong is that you can do one form for a decade and it will never fail. It'll just keep evolving or you can do many different forms and get the same distance as long as you keep moving. Keep breathing, keep moving, keep focusing. That's the practice. My teacher, Raja Yanka, is, is uh, famous for saying, you know, what's the best form of Qigong? The one that you'll do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and sometimes that requires a little spiritual science on yourself, too, to figure that out. And Oh, yeah. There's been parts of my life where my practice fell off because I felt like I couldn't do how much of it I wanted to do or how many forms and sets I wanted to do in one shot. And then I would eventually realize, Oh, well, how about I break it up throughout the day and just do chunks at a time? See how that works. There's like no reason, like the one that you'll do, that's the best kind. And that's an example of it. Really cool. I wanted to ask you while we're at the point we're at in the show, if there's any resources that you might be comfortable pointing people towards and learning some useful forms. I can point to some resources that I think people can consider. Jim McRitchie, who is the, uh, you can find him at the global chi project.com is a, a man I studied with in Boulder, Colorado. And Jim's work on the eight extraordinary meridians and connecting that to some of the practices of Mantok Chia is phenomenal. And he gives it away for free. So if you, anyone out there who's interested in learning that, that next level internal movement of energy, I would pick up his work and start there. It's just, again, he gives it away for free. And Jim is the type of person where he can, if you email him, he'll answer a question. You know, he's a great, great guy. Now, in, for, in terms of, of Qigong, I think the problem that we have with Qigong is that there are way too many 200-hour programs in the country. So... 
in 200 hours, let me tell you something, you're, you're scratching the surface of what's possible. You're not really mastery enough to become a teacher. That being said, I think one of the best programs that I've seen out there is Raja Yonka's program at the Institute of Integral Qigong and Tai Chi in Santa Barbara. He's got one of the, the most highly developed programs that I've seen and, and I've participated in and I'm certified through him. So I'm a little biased at that point, but he's got one of the best programs out there and his forms are easy to learn and you can move up through you know the, the basic forms into the more advanced forms. After that, there's a handful of people that I would look at. Ken Cohen, again, is, is a, a master. I'm not sure how much Ken is teaching these days anymore, but his books are great if you pick them up. Zheng Jing Ming is probably the other guy that I would point to out of Boston who is just phenomenal in terms of that transition of being able to do New Orange Gung from a book. And then if you're interested in Tai Chi, I would say check out Teapot Monk, uh, the European podcaster. His online classes are great, and he's got a very humorous approach to teaching Tai Chi digitally that works. So, you know, those are my shout outs to people that I really respect in the industry. Awesome. That gives me a lot to check out. And who knows, maybe even future guests, you never know. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's shift gears a little bit and look at the the larger world situation once again. And, you know, people are probably all over the place, maybe not our listeners, because they have maybe evolved a little past that, but I think people all over the place at the very least have before felt disappointment on how unchangeable the world seems when we try to force our will upon it. And in the book, there's at least a couple of sections where you talk about reimagining the world. And maybe in this Saturn and Aquarius next couple of months over the summer, we could have the opportunity to actually do that. And what, what do you think uh, the individual level looks like when it comes to reimagining the world? Is that something the only person can answer for themselves or are there some things that might actually cause change to catch on? I would say the expressions are all going to be individualistic. You know, you are, and I'm speaking to the listeners now, you are the master of yourself. You are your expression. You know, you are in control of that. Whether you use yoga, Tai Chi, Jigong, meditation, some other form of mindfulness, getting more deeply in touch with yourself, rooting out that kind of fight or flight response from your life so that you can look at the world as it comes at you in its wholeness. That's all on you. How you get there is how you get there. I, I can't say one practice is better than another practice. I can say that when you get there, it's going to be frightening at the amount of absolute possibilities that will emerge in your life. A lot of people turn away because it seems unreal. So, you know, you really have to believe in yourself. You have to believe that this is your path and you have to do the work. And I guess that's the only thing I can say to people is that, you know, if you want the world to change, do the work. There's no shortcut. I do not believe in the secret. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I am not a person who, who thinks that. By the way, Mitch Horowitz has a great, and I forget the name of his book, but he's got a book out there that talks about that whole new thought philosophy starting from the 19th century into the 21st that led into and has extended from the secret and he breaks it down and he takes it apart and it's beautiful. And I, anyone who wants to understand that that tradition doesn't start with that book and those people definitely look into Mitch Horowitz's work. But that being said, again, you have to do the work, you know, the, it, you just can't manifest reality. Now I said that at the same time, I'm aware of the fact that, you know, quantum physics is pointing more and more, in the direction that reality is responsive to us. But keep it in mind, the Tao, the drift, the universe is not your servant. You are, part, you are part of it and you have to act in accordance with it and you have to create within the boundaries of it and you cannot will it to do what you want without some nasty side effects. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, this has been a really awesome conversation, man. I'd love to, uh, first of all, thank you for spending some time with me today. And we covered quite a range and I loved it. And I wanted to give you a chance to wrap up any loose threads that might need tying and also let people know the best way to find what you do and connect with you if they want to reach out and uh, yeah, give, give some plugs for your online presences. Okay. Well, right now I only have the website. I've kind of, because of clearly the pandemic, <laughs> I've canceled a lot of what I was doing this year to see how things were going to play out. And that's just from a standpoint of, you know, I can't run a workshop if I don't think anyone's going to show up for it. So I'm not going to spend the money to set it up. So I'm, I'm kind of going to dial it back this year, do more of this, definitely more talking online. So you can find me at www.anthonygulbert.net, and that will give you a link to whatever else I create. Right now, I'm kind of in this place of, of assessing, as I was mentioning earlier, where is the novelty I want to pursue? And what direction am I going to head in with all of this you know, happening? So people can find me there, and that will always link off to anything else I happen to be creating in the, in the future months. The book is available on Amazon, definitely. You know, like you said, it's in the show notes, so definitely click on it if you're interested in it. Right now, we've lowered the book. We're down to the last couple of hundred. So we've lowered the price of the book from 20 to 15, and we've dropped the price of the digital edition down to a buck 99. Wow, you can't beat that. Yeah, just to get it out there. And that was really more just early on, Definitely had a lot of energy in terms of the the Tai Chi Qigong community, and they've been very receptive to the book. But getting it into the hands of the average reader, it's been a bit a little bit slower. So you know, the idea of dropping the price before we you think about either one or two things are going to happen. We're going to do a second printing of Notes from the Drift, or I am going to finish up the second volume, which will come out, and that's going to be more. Focused on, um, whereas Notes from the Drift definitely said, okay, in order to understand, remove yourself from the system, go off into, you know, the wilderness, go off into those liminal spaces and exist there and, and reflect on the difference. This is going to be more about Taoist ideas at work in, a, in more urban environments. So it'll, it'll be different in its flow, but it's, I explained it to somebody like this. I said, Notes from the Drift is blues. The second book is jazz. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. And it's not the only book of yours that I'll have the chance to check out going forward because you have written some other stuff too. I have my, the book that came before Notes from the Drift, which is a book of poetry, is available through my website. You can buy that. I don't think it's on Amazon. And then there is a PDF copy of one of my early books, more of the beatnik stuff called uh, Back Alley America that you can download for free from my website. Very cool. Free, free. <laughs> go go get it, guys. Check out Anthony's website. And thanks a lot for being here again. And this was super fun. I'm sure that we could talk about that urban application of understanding the drift whenever it comes about. So definitely keep me in the loop, man. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. And good luck with the podcast. Appreciate it. All right, people, we finished the episode and I'm glad that you are still here with me at the end because I want to encourage you to support Anthony in this time of difficult financial prospects for many people with a pretty inexpensive purchase of his book on Amazon if you want to get it there. Of course, you could buy the paperback version and that's always cooler, but $1.99 for something that you can read on any device you want, that's pretty nice. and. I think that you'll get a lot out of it. The way it's formatted really would allow you to take it in in bite-sized chunks if you want or go through it all at once. But it's really like these snippets and vignettes of moments throughout Anthony's travels. And a lot of them are only one or two pages. So I guess like that's maybe sort of like a chapter or I don't know, an individual poem. The cool thing about this book is it really blurs the lines between genres of books. <laughs> it's somewhat anthropological, it's somewhat philosophical, it's somewhat memoir-ish. It's got a little bit of everything. It's definitely poetic. And I had a lot of fun reading it. So of course, I also want to say big thanks to Anthony for coming on the show. It does feel timely because we had such a good Qigong 
oriented conversation a couple of weeks ago with C Free. I encourage you to check that out if you haven't heard that yet, because it was also really good. Of course, I think all the episodes of my show are at least pretty good, if not really, really good. <laughs> and if you think the show is pretty good too, you might want to consider getting more of it. Like I mentioned in the intro, I did just go through a birthday. And I'd love for my gift from you and my gift to you to be that you sign up for Plus and get the two-hour version of this show and all of the awesome episodes in the archive. So why don't I run down a couple of the topics in the Plus extension, and then I've got some responses to a few of these topics that I'd like to touch on as well. And for those of you who do decide to sign up on patreon.com forward slash interverse or find the link in the show notes to do that. This episode, you're going to find a generous description of a legitimate transcendental experience right at the beginning of the Plus show, which is sometimes kind of hard to pull out of people or rare that people have even actually had. So that was a pretty interesting way to kick things off. And then we talked about continuing our practices even after a permanently illuminating and yet extremely challenging temporary ego dissolution. And I know that probably a lot of you out there have experienced something like that as well. We talked about why awareness practices may grant more lasting changes than psychedelics in the long run. We talked about not seeking to find oneself, but seeking to create oneself. And then we did a Taoist inspired riff on creativity and finding our authenticity and the idea of the Wu Wei, which is effective non-action, a pretty beautiful paradox that I love talking about. We talked about some of Anthony's favorite authors, including Walt Whitman, an anthropologist author named Wade Davis. And we got into just how valuable diversity really is. We gave Anthony's native New Yorker perspective on some of the occult aspects of the Trump presidency. That was interesting. Didn't think we'd go there, but I don't mind talking about that at all. We examined the opportunistic behavior of corrupt authority figures, the rapidly shattering illusion that our government system actually creates freedom or harmony. And at the end, we talked about reawakening wonder and excitement in our worldview and finding flexibility in our minds. Now, of course, that's not everything we talked about, not by a stretch, but I've got to give you a summary. I can't tell you all of it. And based on that summary, if I was hearing it, I'd think that was worth my five bucks a month or at least five bucks for one month. But hey, I, I like a lot of podcasts. I subscribe to quite a few, actually. <laughs> so thank you to the subscribers that are signed up to Interverse because that helps me just pay that money forward and have some good subscriptions myself to shows I really like. But now I want to talk about maybe some ways we can respond to the situation we're in right now in this particular part of the time-space continuum. I really think that Qigong has been one of the most powerfully healing types of work I've ever found to do on myself. And it's a longer story than this, but even the way that I found out about it many years back was pretty interesting and weird. I'd had this long string of synchronistic occurrences that led me to wind up with this cool little pocket stone that I was carrying around. And it felt like it had sort of a spirit to it, like it was almost able to put ideas in my head or, I don't know, it's kind of a nebulous concept when you talk about the way one might communicate with the crystals. And some people might think that's just way too woo-woo, probably not the crowd that checks out this show. But I did have this stone and a whole amazing series of events was what even led me to have it. I had some attachment to it. And I was walking around this event late at night, and this idea popped in my head really strongly. You need to give that stone away to somebody that's around you right now. And there's a lot of people around. And so I just kind of went with it. It felt that strong of an urge that I thought that I should, even though I didn't really want to give up the stone. So I did. Uh, this young woman that was coming by, I just gave her the stone. I was like, probably seemed kind of weird. I was like, I just have a strong feeling I'm supposed to give this to you. Here you go. And that was going to be it for me. But then she was like, oh, wow, this is so cool. I feel like I have to tell you about something now to make, you know, to reciprocate this cool gift. And so she says, have you ever heard of Qigong? I don't know a lot about it, but I'm just feeling like I should tell you to check out Qigong, look into Qigong. And I was like, oh, I don't know what that is at all, but I definitely made a note in, of, of that. And when I got back home from the trip I was on, I did look it up. I found a cool website called longwhitecloudqigong.com. Longwhitecloudqigong.com. Great teacher that I picked up. Definitely 
the basics and a little more from checking out his videos on that website. And from then, I've had an um, on again, off again, but almost completely on relationship with doing Qigong. And like we talked about a lot in this episode and with C Free, it was a huge awareness boosting exercise and really gave me more access to my personal energy and my chi than I've ever had before. So why I'm talking about this specifically right now is because I want to implore you guys to make this time that you're stuck at home, the time that you always remember is when you learned a very important skill or some kind of very useful practice. Maybe it's not Qigong. Maybe it's not Tai Chi. Maybe it's meditation. Maybe it's something that I haven't even mentioned. Maybe it's something you already know that you want to learn about and you've just felt like you hadn't had the time to deal with it. So don't use this whole panic crisis lockdown thing as a excuse to just sort of regress and go back into a almost childlike state of being at home with nothing to do. Because if you spend the time learning a new skill that in the normal hustle and bustle of life, you probably felt like you didn't have time to figure out or to teach yourself, you'll have that forever. Even when the so-called real world resumes, it's normally scheduled programming. You'll have this thing to put to use at your disposal at, for all time. You might even be able to teach it to other people at some point. It might become a big major component in your life, or it might integrate with something that you are going to do in the future in a way that you just can't predict right now. So use this time of the year that's naturally supposed to be about growth, birth, and renewal, and make it about the birth of something new in you that's really good and a new you. Because it seems like every spring, there's a bigger than ever push to get everyone afraid or remorseful about death, about a celebrity death, or right now, obviously, there's a huge scare about coronavirus. So don't let your script that nature has given us be flipped by the panic on the TV. You know, you could maybe plan your garden or do something that focuses your mind on the positive possibilities. Help those emerge into existence instead of possibly making yourself more susceptible to getting sick or going into a low health state just because of stress, which is a huge factor in people's health. Stress is a huge factor. I mean, I don't have to tell you that. We all know that. And I don't want to make this sort of like a classic podcast outro where the host ambushes the uh, the guest when they're not there to defend themselves and <laughs> disagrees with something because I totally respect the opinion. But in the plus extension, uh, Anthony kind of hinted at that he seems to think that a lot of conspiracy ideas or conspiracy research is silly or, or uh, foolish. I mean, I'm not trying to put words in his mouth. That was kind of the gist that I got. And that's okay as an opinion. I mean, for me, from the way I look at things and what I've learned and researched makes it seem more likely than not that there could be such a thing as major crazy conspiracies and that they happen more often than anybody realizes. Because when information is compartmentalized and cogs in the machine are just following orders and worshiping experts and not really knowing for themselves what's right or wrong or even knowing what their actions are contributing to, uh, it seems like a lot could happen. <laughs> and there's also a concept that I want to throw in there too, which is that the universe is an as above, so below system. And our individual neural pathways are kind of chaotic or sometimes even psychopathic in the sense of how we get stuck into patterns that hurt ourselves or hurt others or just bad perspectives or lack of awareness. And if that's true for a lot of people on the individual level, then on the as a bow level, there must be some kind of universal neural pathways or what you could call etheric channels. I think that's what the researcher Michael Wan calls them. And these things, these grooves, these tendencies that arise in the larger patterns of human behavior are going to mirror the problematic patterns of individuals, but on a massive scale. And it's going to be in sync and coordinated, and it's not even going to require any top-down control. So to another degree, conspiracies might not be, or some conspiracies or some things that appear to be conspiracies might not be like a total planned out farcical operation as much as just the, uh, the way things are trending, you know? So that's not to say I, I disagree or don't think that Anthony is right when he said in the uh, plus extension that a conspiracy is a hard thing to pull off and that someone's always going to let something slip. I agree with that. 
but also in in real life, there are examples of inside whistleblowers of the military or corporations that have some pretty crazy shit to say, but they're simply not heard because they're labeled as conspiracy nutters. So I want to just keep a lot of possibilities in mind. I don't want to say I know for sure something that I wasn't there to know, <laughs> but I do want to look at the possibilities. And the real thing that I don't want to contribute to is fear or panic. And I also do agree highly with Anthony's assessment that during crisis situations, conspiracy or no, there's a serious opportunism that comes down from the authority figures where, you know, look at the Patriot Act that followed up 9-11, for example. Are we going to see some kind of Patriot Act coming out of the coronavirus situation? I'm going to talk about this more, maybe in a totally solo episode, but I've got one returning guest coming back to talk about <laughs> the conspiratorial perspective on what's going on right now. And I don't want to say that no one's dying or no one's getting sick when I'm talking about coronavirus, but I do have a lot of compiled information and research that puts the entire concept of what people think is going on into very dubious light. And I'm excited to get that to you guys. I might, like I said, do a solo episode where I go over some research, which would be a first probably. But I've been thinking for a long time that maybe I want to start doing more solo stuff because I have uh, I started a podcast because I had shit to say, <laughs> but I also started the podcast because I wanted to hear what other people had to say. So maybe some solo content would be a good way for me to get stuff off my chest without having to inject it into somebody else's opportunity to speak their mind about this, that or the other thing. But as far as the idea of opportunism during the crisis goes, I'll name a few things. It seems like there are some big time draconian gun control measures being considered. There is digital encryption being possibly banned coming soon. The Federal Reserve has made some changes that allow for uh, them to make loans, any bank to make loans without any kind of any kind of capital in their stockpile. And these are things I've heard. So whenever I get to the point of doing this like research solo episode, I'm going to have links and sources and confirm what I'm saying and not just have hearsay. But it's just weird that there's people that would have been totally against a Bernie Sanders style socialism stimulus package, but now they're totally on board and agreeing with Trump's version. And I don't want to be overly political with what I'm talking about here, but this affects all of us if there's huge, huge inflation for any reason, especially in a time where the economy is being ground to a halt then the purchasing power of the dollar is going to get even weaker. And it's already gotten really weak since the institution of the Federal Reserve. Hopefully you guys have done some personal research about the history of the Federal Reserve, the creature from Jekyll Island, as they call it. Look up a book of that name, Creature, of Jekyll, creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin. And that is a good one to go to or look up the uh, Corbett Report documentary called Century of Enslavement. That's just if you don't really have a background on how shady the entire Federal Reserve System is, which is what is sort of in control and things like it on a global scale, like the World Bank. Those are things that are really having a lot of influence over what our economy is going to be and what it has been. But I'm getting pretty long in the outro here, and I'm definitely getting off topic from some of the stuff that we were even talking about in this episode. Just wanted to say some of this stuff and good luck out there to everybody. <laughs> Take care of each other. Be nice to each other. Don't shame people for, you know, not having the same opinion as you. If you are really sure that this is a infectious virus pandemic that is possibly going to wipe out millions of people or something. Just know that we're all dealing with our own mental health issues in our own ways. and. Definitely try to get outside, try to be kind, and maybe keep an eye on the space weather. The uh, astrologers have, we're already predicting a lot of weirdness and chaos for this year at the beginning of the year. At least some of them were the ones that I was listening to or checking out. And we did just have this Saturn conjunction with Pluto, which is a very extreme thing. And then Saturn is just now, as we're talking, moving into Aquarius, which is kind of 
interesting because Saturn's the malefic and Aquarius is its air sign. So we're looking at at least a fear about an airborne pathogen contagion. <laughs> but there's going to be a conjunction between Pluto and Jupiter on April 4th, which is 4-4. A number that I thought was kind of cool because in the episode I pulled an I Ching tarot card, which is number 44, which is the attraction of opposites. And Jupiter and Saturn are pretty opposite. So for Pluto to be conjuncting one and then the other is kind of weird. But maybe that extreme that Pluto brings to the table in conjunction with Jupiter could possibly be something that benefits us all because Jupiter is kind of the abundance and happiness type of planet. It, it rules a lot of nice things. Expansion, if you had to put it down to one word. But on the other hand, the uh, powers that could, should not be are. So sounds like they're planning on giving everybody in the country a check, which is kind of a Pluto and Jupiter type of scenario. But on a possibly darker uh, result when it comes to what the economy is about to be going through. I don't know enough to be like an expert or anything, but nothing's free. I mean, <laughs> someone pays for it. And obviously everything financial in this system, if you are aware of what fiat currency even is it comes at a debt so let's all find ways where we can expand and grow without anything debt related being involved whether that's growing your own food this year or learning these practices that can help you tap into more of your chi reserves and take care of ourselves most of all <laughs> and then this was definitely a long intro or outro yeah and uh I wanted to just say before we end that I'm going to kick up the novelty level and the outro with some new tunes from our recent guest, Suhan, from his brand new album, Vague and Familiar. You can find that on SoundCloud. Look up Suhan, S-O-O-H-A-N. And yeah, links to everything we talked about, including some links to very good books, are in the show notes as well. Thanks again to Anthony for being with us on this great episode. and. A bigger thank you to you for showing up for your own exploration and your own self-knowledge and your own curiosity. Keep that curiosity hot and don't believe the hype, especially the fear hype. Look into stuff for yourself. I'll try to share some resources soon. Like I said, maybe a solo episode, but until then, stay frosty out there and <laughs> love each other. Be good, all that. And I will catch you on the flip. <laughs>